So this morning, let's start off with a little bit of word association. We're going to go all the way back to some elementary school days, um, which might be helpful to some of us more than others. We'll see. Um, How would you know if an airplane was an airplane? Any thoughts? You can respond. Anybody? How would you know if an airplane was an airplane? It's in the air. It flies, right? Like, yeah, it's doing its thing. Good. How, how would you know if a car was a car? Drives? Yeah, good. See, this is, this is good. We're warming up. How would you know if a restaurant was a restaurant? It restaurants. Well done. I like that, right? Serves food. You know what you're going to get there. How, how would you know if a Christian was a Christian? Not, that's Christian Pulisic. Uh, that U.S. men's national team. I don't, I don't know if you guys, soccer, no? Okay. Uh, this kind of Christian. How would you know a Christian? Anybody? What would you say? There you go, sticker on the car. Good. Bumper stickers. Yep, that's good. I think I heard, was that you, Teresa? What was the one word? Love. Right, I think Jesus said something about that, right? That you will, you will know them by your love. Or they will know me by your love. They will know that you are my disciple because you love others. So I guess question this morning is, how is that going? What are you known for? Barna uh, is a research group that studies church and culture here in the West. And they put a lot of good information out. And every handful of years, they actually send a poll out uh, amongst a very diverse group of people, um, but primarily our youngest generation that could respond to a poll. And year over year, they, they find some things out, and they continue to ask this question, what is the perception of Christians in America? What do people outside of church, what do people who do not identify as a Christian, what do those people think of Christians? Right? And our response is that we, we love each other, right? Like that's what people know us by. But year over year, every handful of years, should I say, what Barna found, finds out is the list that looks a little bit more like this. Judgmental, old-fashioned, homophobic, extremist, oppressive, too political. This is just, this is just the short list. And I think probably the one that stands out the most is hypocritical hypocrisy. Those that are outside the church, those that that look at the church from the outside in, that look at the way Christians interact, that interact with people who call themselves Christians, they pick up these or they do love. Now, if you're here this morning and you're surprised by that, you're a Christian, you're surprised to hear this list, I would ask how many friends do you have outside the church? How many people do you know that are not Christians. And maybe you're here as this person. You've struggled to see value in Christianity. You've struggled to see value in the church because you see more of this than anything else. You see hypocrisy. And if that's you this morning, if you are here, it coming from that place, I just want to first say, like, I see you. I get it. I also want to say, I'm sorry. Like, that's not how we as Christians, we as followers of Jesus, want to represent ourselves. And then whatever it took for you to come this morning, whatever it's taken you in this last season of life to maybe like, hey, let's, let's check this out. Let's get back into this. I'm so glad that you are here. Now, I don't know about you, but this does check out a bit in my own life. I've probably told the story before, but I remember golfing with a, a person that's close in my life, and we were just talking about church and what was their church background and why don't they go to church and, you know, would you ever consider going to church and these kind of things. And his response was, why would I willingly go hang out with a bunch of hypocrites? And I remember sitting there in the golf cart, and first of all, being like, man, it's, it's a good question. <laughs> and then second of all, I was like, crap, I'm a Christian. What, is that? what, do, you, what do you mean? Like, you're, you're talking about me. Like, what is it? And I didn't want to know what he thought about me in that moment, to be honest with you. But like, it, it, it checks out. 
People I know that I love dearly, that I'm close with, have a very skewed view of what Christianity is and what the church is. They would agree a lot more with Barna's research than what we would love for our response to be here in this room. And that can be a, a sobering reality um, in a lot of ways. So if we just sit with that for a second, like just, just sit with that, that statement that he made. Why would I want to willingly go hang out with a bunch of hypocrites? What I want to explore from here is why the gap? Why, why the gap from the statement of, they'll know us by our love, to others being like, no, I don't want to go hang out with a bunch of hypocrites. Like, what's the gap? Because I think, in, like, in my mind, I'm like, yes. Like, people will know me by in love. Like, I want to be a loving person. I believe that to be true in Christianity. I believe that to be true as an identifier of being a Christian. But why is there a gap? Why is that the perception that gets picked up? And I think what we're going to do is we're going to look at James, and we're not going to find all the answers here. I'll, I'll, I'll say that off the bat. But when we explore the book of James, what we're doing is we're looking back to a historical context as James is writing to Christians that have been dispersed and spread out along amongst and outside the Roman Empire because they're being persecuted. They're being killed for their faith. People are being stoned to death. People's Christians' heads are being put on stakes to be lit on fire to light up garden parties for Emperor Nero. I mean, a lot of stuff's going on here. And he's writing to them to give them spiritual wisdom for the season that they're in. And we're calling this sermon series, Now What? And we have a handful more weeks after this. What we want to do is look for spiritual wisdom in the season that we find ourselves in now. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like we're on some some sifting sand. Over this last year especially, as, as we look across just the globe, we just continue to see so many unknowns play out. Unknowns personally in our lives, amongst health and relationships, amongst career. But then there's a lot of things that we do know that are happening. We look at social injustice, racial injustice. We look at uh, uh, wage discrepancies and disparities. As as in this last year, the rich have gotten richer and the poor have gotten poorer. We can continue to see these things play out. Faith being questioned left and right, crumbling from underneath us. As a lot more people are looking for spiritual things, but are not finding it in faith and in God or in the church. We are in some sifting sands right now in so many ways. And you have some very unique things in your life also. But I think James speaks to us in a lot of ways. We're going to start in one chapter, or chapter 1, verse 19. He says this, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. It could just be a sermon in and of itself. James speaks pretty clearly, pretty plainly. He does not hold any punches by any means. And just in a few verses here, James has tied together that to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, when you, when you actually look to the life and teachings of Jesus and want to follow them in your life, to be the people of God, when you do not do what it says, you have deceived yourself. You have forgotten who you are. And right off the bat, I don't think James would love the idea of Barna's research about how Christians and Christianity is perceived by culture, especially our youngest generation. He continues in verse 26, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight ring on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Again, there is a doing by which Christians are associated by. And again, it's not Barna's research. We're going to jump forward to chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, 
but does not actually do anything about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accomplished by action, is dead. (laughs) James is holding no punches here. But just as a starter, I think one of the greatest questions that James lays in front of us here is who are you becoming? Is it Christian? Is it a disciple? Is it a follower of Jesus? Is someone trying to figure out faith in God? Who are you becoming? We can look at a quick list here. Everything that I just read, all the verses, if we actually extract the list that James has given us versus what Barnum Research has given us, it looks like this. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Let's just start with those and like, when's the last time you jumped on social media? And like specifically, when have you looked at Christians interacting on social media? And maybe more pointed, when's the last time you examined the ways that you interact on social media? And it keeps going, righteous, rightness with God, no moral filth, humility, doer of the word, look after the poor and marginalized. Just from a handful of verses here, James is associating being and doing. He's associating believing and doing. Again, much different than the cultural perception for those outside the church. So I ask again, like, what gives? Where, where, why is there a gap? Why are these things that James is calling us to that he sees in the life and the teachings of Jesus oftentimes feel so far from the way we actually see faith being played out, where we see being a Christian actually plays out. In verse 19, I think he kind of hones in here. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. To you this morning, have you boiled down following the ways of Jesus just to a you boil it down maybe to just saying a prayer and the idea that you're just going to go to heaven. You boil it down to that, just to a belief that it is okay just to believe in God and everything else will just figure itself out. It doesn't matter who I'm becoming because I'm going to heaven. I got to worry about everything else. And I don't think it stops there. Have you, have you boiled down being a Christian to a certain belief within a political system? Have you boiled down being a Christian to a belief into a certain worldview? This is the right worldview to be a Christian. This is the right stance to have. These are the right opinions about everything going on. Man, if I could just have all the right beliefs, I'm being a good Christian. Man, but those on the outside that don't have the same beliefs, ah, they can't be Christians. There's There's no way. Have you boiled it down to one particular worldview, one political system, maybe even morals? There are certain morals that you would say, man, that's, that's Christian and that's not Christian. And I'll be the first to say, yeah, I think it's constantly happening. I am constantly working through to break out of my own worldview to not judge and ridicule and pick apart other people because of their worldview. Political system, morals. I mean, you just, every single day I feel like I'm working through that actually to be Christian might expand outside of the way that I see the world. And I have a feeling you're in the same boat. Because isn't it easier just to agree with the right viewpoint? It's easier to just agree with the right thing than to actually do or become the right thing. The right cultural statements, maybe it's the right ballot at the polls, way easier. Rather than becoming a person of virtue, isn't it just easier to virtue signal? I think James would say a real person of virtue doesn't just virtue signal. A real person of virtue cares about people who don't line up with their values. Because isn't this what we see in Jesus? Thought about that? Like if Jesus was to hang out with you, (laughs) 
how much would you have wrong? Like, do you think he just fits into the box of what your worldview is or what your political beliefs are? So, where are you holding to just belief? That, that all of Christianity is just the right beliefs and the right viewpoints. That others are getting it wrong or, ba- or right based on their worldviews. So just take a moment. Like, like, actually, just pause for a second. I want you to imagine the person that just drives you crazy. Yeah, everything about the person. Their worldviews, their politics, the opinions they have on what it is to live a moral life. Like, just pause. Who's the person that drives you crazy? No elbows. No, no, no hitting them if they're next to you. But just sit with that for a minute. Who's that person? And then, picture the person that's doing it all right. They're showing up to the right things. They're reading the right books. They're reposting the right things. It's probably the person that's most similar to you. They agree with you. You like each other's stuff, right? You like gossiping about the same thing or venting about the same stuff. Now, in those two people, is there a possibility that the person you can't agree with, the person who you just cannot stand, the one that drives you crazy, could actually be open to God working in their life? Because I have this in my life. I have people who I'm like, I do, I don't know how you arrived there. Like, like I, I get that there's different worldviews, but like that's actually illogical. Like that does not make sense how you've arrived here. Like it, it drives me crazy. Yet some of these people are the most generous people I've ever met in my life. Some of these people can just extend forgiveness without question. Some of these people are just joy-filled and, and, and like exuding just encouragement to others. Have, can we get a, uh, some fresh batteries? We'll swap out one of them. Um, we use rechargeables around here, and sometimes stuff gets charged. Sometimes it doesn't. But with that, and then check it out. Like, the person showing up to the same things as you. I, I don't know what world you swim in politically, but, like, the person showing up to, like, the correct protests. Oh, yeah, the people that are, like, doing good stuff, but, like, you just can't agree with. Like, what is that? How do you, how do you make sense of that? See, I think James is pointing to something that we could be doing all the right things but becoming the absolutely wrong person. (laughs) The crazy part. We could be doing a lot of the wrong stuff in our own minds that are actually becoming the right kind of people. I, I just don't know what to do with that, to be honest with you. I don't. But in all of this, as we think about these people, as we look across the board and how different everyone is, I love the saying that we stand where we sit. We have all grown up sitting under something for our entire life, and we now stand from that same position. And everyone has sat in a complete opposite point from you their entire life. And they stand at a complete opposite point because of where they sat. And how can we hold that open-handed in a way where we are open to God doing a work inside of us to become the right person and not just simply default to thinking that we have to have the right beliefs. Because I would say right now, the gap that we see that James points to is that, especially right now, inside of Christianity, it it is more important to have the right answer. It's more important to get to the right theology, the right doctrine, the right stance on things, and then to express that politically, express that culturally, express that morally. But are we actually becoming different people? Are we actually becoming people of love and goodness and beauty? Or do we just have to be the right all the time and just have the right beliefs in everything? And in all honesty, I think arriving on beliefs, worldviews and opinions simply just limit us. They limit what God wants to do in and through us and Worse off, I think they limit us seeing what God wants to do in and through other people. Because when they don't align with us, then they're doing it wrong, and I've completely canceled out God is actually working in and through their life. We'll start wrapping up here. James actually wraps up this section. This is, this is great. Old Testament reference. 
uh, chapter 2, verse 20, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father, father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous for what they do and not by faith alone. Who you are becoming will lead to what you do. Or, as Barna proved, we can have actions that aren't actually aligning up with what we think we should be becoming. We can check the boxes. We can show up here on Sunday mornings. We can read scripture in the mornings. We, we can do all the things that we're supposed to do. But if we are not actually open to what God wants to do in us, that he actually wants to confront us and call us to more, we will continue to be the same people just doing the same thing over and over again. That is a massive danger. But the other one is to say, oh, I've got to figure it out. I believe all the right things. I'm doing all the right things. I, I don't have to do anything because I believe. And James is pretty pointing here. Abraham, one of the fathers of our faith. Maybe one, you know, the whole song, Father Abraham. I mean, like, like everyone knows Abraham. And he said, Abraham, not even just believing, but it was because he did. He actually trusted God enough to bring his son Isaac to the altar to sacrifice him, his only son, the son that all the nations were going to come through. And Abraham's like, what are you talking about? All the promises, God, that you gave me, they're all going to go away if he dies. I, I can't do this. But it was his belief in God's promises. It was his belief in God's faithfulness. It was his belief that God is right and just and good that led him to act. Abraham was becoming a person who could trust God, who could hear God's voice and move on that. And I want us to hear this. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. See, there's a point you bring up the belief thing again, right? It's like, well, hold on, you can't just believe. But belief here for Abraham is he, is he just everything that he's about to do that just does not make sense? His belief empowers his becoming. But it wasn't belief in the right worldview. It wasn't belief in the right politics. It wasn't belief in the right moral values. It was belief in what God was doing. It was belief in God's faithfulness. And in that, God empowered Abraham to act as he was following God. And then check this out. This, this twists a lot of stuff for me. And he goes one step further in verse 25. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Rahab, in the book of Joshua, as, as they're about to attack the city of Jericho, she is literally a harlot. She, she, she is a prostitute. Her, her moral uh, life is, is so far outside of what it looks like to be a person of God in this. And it literally says here, in the same way, it was not even Rahab, Rahab the prostitute considered righteous, meaning right with God. Because what happens is the spies come, she's put into a decision to say, do I believe that God is doing this? Do I believe that God is behind this? Do I believe that God is calling me to act? And her belief, she actually goes on to say, um, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Because she believes in the things that God is doing and who God is, her believing empowers her becoming. And then she acts out of that. What do you do with the moral things that we've driven, drawn lines on and who's a Christian or not? She's, she's a Gentile prostitute. She is outside the people of God and now she's righteous. You know what else happens in and through Rahab? Jesus. Like she is named in the lineage that without her, Jesus does not come. Could it be that people who are outside of your moral compass, that are on the wrong side of town, that talk differently than you would, that pants are too low, I mean, just keep going down the list. What moral distinctions have you put on people? Because you believe the right thing and they don't. Now, all of a sudden, we just start to just divide. And we can't believe that God would actually do something through someone who is so morally messed up. But isn't that all of our stories? God did amazing, the miraculous. I mean, just keep going, let's through Rahab, a prostitute. But it was not Rahab themselves. It was not uh, Abraham themselves. It said there that as with the body without spirit is dead, so without deeds is dead. 
If we go all the way back to one, chapter 1, verse 21, James says, humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Meaning to actually step into a humble position and receive Jesus and his spirit in our lives. Because that is what will save us. Not the right worldview. Not the right political view. Becoming a person that is open to what God is doing in and through your life. Becoming a person that is open to what God is doing in and through the lives of others. Becoming a person that is reliant on the saving work that Jesus does, that his spirit does in and through us, is how we become everything that God is calling us to. Because wasn't it Jesus who came to be like us so that we could become like him? That is the empowerment. It's not the check boxes. It's not the right worldview. And I know for some of you this falls short because aren't we supposed to change people? Aren't we supposed to just, everyone else that has it wrong, like someone does need to tell them. Someone needs to correct them. But I would push back and ask, is that supposed to be you? Is it supposed to be you? I mean, do you have anything in your life that you don't want other people to know about? The things that, you know, you're working through and kind of want to keep hidden and, you know, all these different things. Like, should it be you or should you just kind of work on yourself? Maybe there's a spirit of like, I just got to change them. I got to correct them. I got to, to, you know, I got to do this thing. That's the wrong point to ever be trying to just correct anyone or tell them they're wrong. So I know this can feel flat because this is more about who are we becoming not who others are becoming, but it's so much easier to look outwards to who others are becoming. What I want you to hear is that through Abraham, through Rahab, God's grace is being poured out on all people. God's grace is being poured out so that we can continue to become the people that God is calling us to be. That we can continue to become the people that God is inviting into his work of reconciling and redeeming all people. I believe he cares a lot less, again, about your beliefs, and he cares a lot more about who you are becoming. There's a Hasidic rabbi that said this, when I was young, I set out to change the world. When I grew older, I perceived that this was too ambitious, so I set out to change my state. This, too, I realized as I grew older was too ambitious, so I set out to change my town. When I realized I could not even do this, I tried to change my family. Now, as an old man, I know that I should have started by changing myself. If I had started with myself, maybe then I would have succeeded in changing my family, the town, or even the state, and who knows, maybe even the world. Worship team, if you want to come up, we're going to move into ministry time here in a second. The gap that we find from the Barna research to becoming identified as people of love, can we drop the idea that it's just about believing the right things? And can we adopt the idea that it's more about becoming the right person. There's a few ways for us to do this. We talk about in Emotionally Healthy Relationships and Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course, we talk about turning to wonder. You know that thing when you hear someone say something that you're like, I don't agree with that. That that response that you want to like, you want to correct them or change them or whatever, or maybe you just want to pull away completely. One thing we talk about is as people are discussing things that we don't agree with, can we turn to wonder ourselves? Can we turn and ask questions like, man, I wonder how they got there. I wonder what events played out in their life of why they would see things that way. And then maybe even go one step further and say, God, what does my response here actually say about me? What, what, how could I change But when I don't agree with something? Next one, I would encourage us to sit with James. Like, pull up, pull up these scriptures. Pull up the second piece of chapter 1 and the second piece of chapter 2. And maybe this week, just spend some time just sitting with it. Read over a few times. And just be quiet and just listen. Don't try and figure out the right beliefs or the right thing to think or the answers or the geek, Greek or the Hebrew. Or like, just literally just read it over and over again and just like let it just, like Jesus has talked to you through it. And what are the areas that he might be calling you to? And then last one, this one, ask someone. Ask someone close to you, are you becoming a person of love? And not the person that's going to be like, oh yeah, you know, you're great. Like the person you see once a week at like your hobby. And like you're always, you're always like your best person there. No, like ask your spouse, ask your siblings, ask your parents, ask, ask your kids. I don't know what age your kids are, but like ask your kids. Are you becoming a person of love? 
And this might help. Why don't we go ahead and stand? So in Galatians 5, Paul actually gives us a list of some things that can actually be happening in and through us. And he gives us this first list. It's, it would be what we would call the acts of the flesh. And these are things within us that, that can just fester and boil out. That if we're not becoming something different, this might be more natural for us. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, orgies and the like. I love how he says that at the end. And the like, you know, everything else. Right? You just, yeah, that's enough. I think you get the picture. But then he says this, and he gives us a list of the fruits of the Spirit. That if God is working in and through you, if you're open to God's Spirit in and through your life, the hope and the prayer is that these things start to happen. You are actually becoming love. You are actually able to like love people better, especially the ones that you don't, you don't agree with and that have offended you. You have more joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self. Like, this is what James is talking about. Can we, can we drop the beliefs and be open to becoming? But I want to remind us, as again, as we see with Abraham and as we see with Rahab, that we can't just muster this up. This isn't just reading more Bible and showing up to serve more and, you know, doing the things. Like, this is just being open to the Spirit of God in and through your life. And then acting upon that. But may it be filled with grace because this is the rest of your life. This is not next week, not four months from now. You know the hard part about that? That means it's the journey for other people also. We have no idea what God is doing in and through other people. And we cannot base everything off of what they believe or what their life may look like right now. But I guarantee you, if we can do this, if we can be open to this, it will benefit everyone around us. We say our vision here is transforming lives, transforming everything. We first and foremost ask God, can I continue to transform into this person? Do you imagine what everything would look like around you if you were this, this? like perfectly this? <laughs> everyone would just change around you naturally. Like that's Jesus. So my invitation is for us as a church, for us as individuals, can we continue to be open what God wants to do in and through us? There is a belief though. And it is a belief that God is redeeming and reconciling the world to himself. And with that, in and through the empowerment of Jesus and his spirit in our lives, the saving grace that has been poured out on us, we actually get to participate in that. We actually get to change.